All Things Cayman, One Radio, Many People, This Is Home. Radio Cayman in the Cayman Islands. Money Sense is brought to you by the Chamber Pension Plan. For further information, visit chamberpension.ky. The Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce Pension Plan, we're here for you. The Chamber Pension Plan is asking for all members to ensure their member details and contact information is correct and up to date. To review and update member details, simply visit chamberpension.ky. Log into your account and provide the necessary information for your personal profile and for your beneficiaries. For assistance in updating member details, call us at 745-7630 or email admin at pensions.ky. The Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce Pension Plan. We're here for you. Money Sense, bringing an informed financial perspective to the Cayman community. A very good morning and warm welcome once again to Money Sense. I'm Simon Cordry and I am delighted to be rejoined this morning by the learned Emil Kalinowski. Emil, good morning. Good morning, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you. You've been fine-tuning your economic antennae. But you have said that you don't want any further introductions, you want no more pleasantries, you want to go straight into the nitty gritty of the global economy. And where are we? Where, where, where are we? It's, it's we Americans pride ourselves as being direct, but maybe we're just blunt. Maybe we should go back to the. I would never call you rude, but you implied it. <laughs> British lovely introduction. Well, before the show started, we were talking about whether or not politics. Mm should be more important to investment decisions. And the reason why is because right now in the United States of America, there's this big, as you put it, kerfuffle regarding whether or not America should pay its debts or the, whether the Congress should uh, authorize further spending by the executive branch and such. And they eventually decided on, yes, go ahead and keep spending this money and pay the debts and such. In other words, do the right sort of things. Do the yes. thing that you've committed to people for the last X number of years just honor your commitments. But I, I, I waved my hand in a dismissive fashion, but, and we were not on YouTube at that moment, but I believe we are right now yes, live are. on YouTube. Yes. So I, I, my Radio hair was K-Man. cut yesterday for the, for the very purpose. You look very handsome. Thank you, thank you. So I waved my hands dismissively at this particular episode regarding the politicians. But in general, I would say that politics is becoming very important with respect to the economy. And we are going back to a time when politicians had their hands deeply inside the eco economic machinery, pulling levers for better or for worse. And we've just simply gotten used to the idea that politicians are not involved ever since the Thatcher and Reagan revolution, which was a counter revolution to exactly what I was just mm -hmm. describing, deep involvement. Now we've gone too far and now the government is gonna be getting involved again. And I can talk about some of the experiences I had when I went down to Chile in the metals and mining industry. I have a good example there, but what, what do you wanna say? Well, I want to probe further on that particular point because you, you, you mentioned the Reagan Thatcher era and it was an era which was notable for many things, but perhaps one of the most notable things from an economics perspective was the willingness of politicians of that generation to give up political control over the economy. So there was the willingness to sacrifice control over monetary policy through statutory independence for central banks, and there was the willingness almost to give up control over fiscal policy because of the acceptance of global capital markets as the determiner of what was available to do. None of that's really changed. Central banks are still independent, and fiscal well, money money markets are still the prime generator of policy decision or the control over politicians willingness to spend so why is it that you, from your perspective then you think that we might be going back a cycle or changing the cycle whereby politicians actually do exert influence because it sort of seems to me as though Churchill's axiom about Americans applies almost to politicians eventually they'll do the right sort of thing they, they'll go kicking and screaming, they'll do stupid things before they get there, but eventually they're sort of forced to do the right thing by the institutions that have been built around them to control their little childish impulses. I believe that we have a cyclical 
nature to our economic and social history. And during that period, it was perfectly acceptable and proper for the politicians to stay out of the economy because they had become so involved and they had directed it into a terrible location. You remember the 1970s? Mm. It was an economic mess. Britain, dreadful. I can't believe it, but I learned recently that it was... You're picking on my home country. It was considered the sick man of Europe. Yes, yes. I, that was actually a phrase in the 1970s yeah. And risks re Britain. re-becoming that if, if we're not careful. E yes, I, and the reason I know this is because it's being brought up again. And the reason why it's being brought up again is because now we followed a different economic policy, but it seems like all economic policies will drive us too far in one direction, and now we need to rebalance and go the other direction. Does that not need, though, a change of the in institutional infrastructure to achieve what you want? In other words, you would need to start to see politicians questioning the value of independent central banks, questioning the value of mm -hmm. these fiscal rules, those fiscal rules. Do you think that's plausible? Well, yes, and I believe, but it's not a change of the institutions which I hope remain in place because the institutions are what dampen the volatility and the institutions should survive cycles. But it's just the perspective and the point of view and the policies that are being dictated from those institutions that I would prefer to happen. Otherwise, there would be great volatility and social unrest, right, if institutions are, are taken down. Well, t well totally, although without without fundamentally changing those institutions, it seems to be slightly difficult to achieve the 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 goal in vertical is the goal or the target that you're talking about or politicians having the ability to influence so what what's the nuance i'm missing there then crises crises most likely will will have everyone rowing in the same direction whereas right now we're all rowing in different directions but a crisis should come along and focus everyone's attention can i give an example mm -hmm. i work in the metals and mining industry and for the last several months, there has been a drumbeat in the financial press regarding critical minerals. And the because of battery, the transition to battery, the, the need for these minerals that are essential to the, the working of such products. That's right. So if we want to go to a green economy, so-called, let us say, where we need to rely on metals and batteries to power cars and vehicles and homes and cities, then we need to mine them. And therefore, we need to go to different countries to get those metals. And because Europe and North America generally have farmed out that responsibility to Africa, South America, and Asia. Because we were in an era of globalization when everyone was on the same team working together. Even if we're not going to a greener energy future, we seem to be entering a second Cold War, a great power politics, or international affairs, again, are tense between Team West and China. So right now, everything is being refined and produced in China. Can we rely on that? And that was a good example during the COVID lockdowns crisis. All of a sudden, our logistical chains were in flux and you couldn't they buy had a malfunctioned. You couldn't buy a refrigerator. You couldn't buy a car because of these tiny little chips in there, which no one previously had even contemplated. Why, why does my refrigerator have a small chip? Who knows, but it does, and that stops, that causes problems. And can we risk, can we risk, as we're moving towards an era of confrontation versus cooperation, where things are made over there? No, we cannot. So therefore, things are now, things, metals are being identified as critical. Mm -hmm. Europe, Canada, the United States, they have all agreed these and these metals are critical, and we need to ensure their production and refinement close to us as opposed to in China. And there you go, that is an example of government getting involved and they're gonna get even more involved because little fascinating nugget as I went to Chile and a conference also in Phoenix, Arizona on the topic of zinc, there is a consistent message from producers f that get these minerals that they are not investing in the future. So the government is saying, these minerals are critical to our country you must get them. And what are the investment plans of producers? Not investing. So you can see the, mm. the crisis that we're heading to. So government will get involved either by subsidizing, guaranteeing, encouraging, forcing the production. And that's is, taking place is there a risk, though, in the that, bigger economy too. Is there a risk that countries such as the US, Canada, Western Europe, what we call the Western democracies, have left it a bit too late? 
because China has been nothing if not adventurous in terms of cultivating ties with South America, African countries, precisely for these reasons, you, well, precisely in relation to these reasons you talk about, to gain the opportunity to control critical infrastructure in the future. Have we left it too late in some of our countries? Yeah, it's a, it, we went from an era of globalization and liberalism and fraternity to switching towards more real politic, realism, mm -hmm. confrontation, and Team West is now playing catch up. But it's not too late. It's they just we have to get uh, our organized organize our systems, our politicians start rowing in the same direction and some crisis will come along which will only encourage that to happen even faster. The irony to me is, and I, I, don't, I don't want to be picking on environmentalists or environmental movement at all, but there is a dirty little secret about this, which is most Western countries don't want to mine minerals in their own country because of environmental damage, but consider it essential to move to industries that rely on the extraction of such minerals as long as it's done somewhere else and somewhere out of sight. Maybe in the future, we will prioritize the employment and the security that they, this sort of mineral processing provides versus the environment. But the big picture that we were discussing is, again, government's involvement should be escalating going forth. And the minerals and metals industry is just one small example of where that's taking place. Do you think we live in a world where it's possible for politicians to harmonize around a national security interest such as that? Yes, I do believe so. I believe so. Harmonize enough more than before, because right during the Cold War, there was big disagreement whether or not the communists should be confronted or rolled back or we should work with them. So yes, uh, it won't be perfect, but we're definitely going from a liberal, laissez-faire, globalized world where politicians are staying out to one where investment decisions will be driven by politicians making, picking favored industries for whatever particular reasons. And this is something that happens in emerging markets already in China. Uh, it's happened all throughout the growth booms of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Politicians said, these industries are critical to our national security and future, and we are going to support them and subsidize them. And I believe that's what's going to happen with Team West. But politicians are traditionally very bad at picking successful industries. They might philosophically have identified an area that's going to do well. Then when they start to deploy capital, A, it gets corrupted away, it gets wasted, there's no discipline, there's no price mechanism. Lots of things then go wrong, so you end up with lots of wastage. So how do you overcome that problem? You listen to Money Sense every <laughs> fortnight for us to navigate the next generation or two, because that's exactly what's going to happen. The politicians will pick favored industries, for good reasons or for re-election reasons and it'll be our job to decide whether or not this is a good idea or not but that seems to be where the the wind is blowing where the current is flowing eventually it'll go too far like at the end of the 1970s and we'll have a counter-revolution the other way but it seems that that's where we're heading nonetheless whether or not the decisions will be right there is a I, risk there's a risk that local there's a risk then that in that sort of environment, leaving aside all the technologi technological progress that's happened, which could increase our growth rates from an economic perspective, but there's a risk that that could lead to a more subdued level of future economic growth with a laissez-faire marketplace, which is very good at allocating resources. That's, in essence, what the pricing mechanism does, to something where resources could be allocated less efficiently and therefore less less or optimally in a sense. Do you, do you worry therefore about what that might mean for future economic growth rates? For very future economic growth rates, but not for near-term economic growth rates. Because we are in a economic depression, our economic growth rates have been miserable for 15 years. So Dr. Frankenstein is going to come in and electroshock this economy back to life with their involvement and there you go. Now we've got growth. We've got movement. We've got activity. But eventually it's Dr. Frankenstein and it's all going to go wrong and we'll need to restart and reset. But at the moment, the patient is near dead, comatose, vegetable. So any near term, no, it'll actually provide a boom like we saw in Japan, South Korea, yeah. Taiwan, post-war Europe. 
post-war America. Yes. Afterwards, Dr. Frankenstein will go too far. Well, with that um, risk of comatose, everyone should just quickly spend the next one minute getting yourself a caffeine injection and rejoin us after our break as we continue the conversation with Emil Kalinowski. The Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce Pension Plan. Become a member today. With six flexible life cycle funds, we help you plan for financial security in retirement. We keep our members informed with the plan's performance through quarterly fund fact sheets. We have an all-in expense ratio of 0.75%, over 16,000 members, and 337 million CI dollars in assets under management. If you would like to join or require further information, visit chamberpension.ky. And for information as it happens, follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram. Email admin at pensions.ky or call 745-7630. The Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce Pension Plan. Become a member today. Money Sense, the only personal finance radio show in the Cayman Islands. Hosted by Simon Caudry from the CFA Society Cayman Islands. This is Money Sense. Welcome back to Money Sense. We are here with Emil Kalinowski, who needs no introduction and will not get a further introduction. Emil the global economy, the state of where we are, the recession, dot, dot, dot. It's your turn. This is segueing to our earlier conversation yeah. where I said we need some sort of crisis for the politicians to align themselves and row in the same direction. Well, I believe a recession can be a crisis, especially if it's a bad one, if it accelerates into a recession, not just in economic activity, but affects money creation, money availability, then it can be a deflationary recession, which is always the worst. Those kind of things are, well, I don't want to use the word depression, but I'm saying that uh, those kind of events are much worse. Deflationary recessions are worse than just business cycles. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, where are we in the in the global economy? It seems that we're steadily progressing towards a recession, and we have been for the last six months or so. And the latest forward-looking indicators, such as purchasing manager indices or consumer outlooks, are generally negative, and at levels that previously were associated with recessions. So. There are a number of indicators in the United States and Europe that suggest that uh, we're heading towards recession. I believe Germany just reported that they are in a recession this week. So we're heading towards recession. The banking crises of March put us at risk of a deflationary monetary mm -hmm. situation or less academically put uh, credit is not available to the system. Yes, yeah, so you can't borrow to fund investment, you can't borrow to fund your day-to-day -day expenses, and you might have to lay off staff as a result of these things. Or even worse, and that's a joke, that you can't repay the debts <laughs> that you've taken out by rolling them over, yeah. because the world is very much in debt. The advanced economies are in tremendous debt, and if the banks aren't extending credit, how are you going to repay the debt that is coming due when they're not offering you the opportunity to roll over that debt, get a new loan, basically, and the economy stinks, so you're not making enough profit. So, I was, I was talking with somebody just yes. yesterday about talking of the word recession, and they, they asked me, what are the chances of the Fed cutting interest rates as aggressively as they've put interest rates up? And I saw my, my, my slightly tongue-in-cheek answer was, that's the last thing you possibly want because the reason they would cut them so aggressively is because everyone's out of jobs because there's a there's a recession a depression type of environment but that could happen right well it will probably happen according to international bond markets which have been found in various academic uh, analyses white papers literature to be the most predictive indicators Yield of curves and shapes of those that's right yeah. and so not just in the united states but in germany and around the world inverted yield curves which we don't have to get into right now what the definitions are but basically bond markets around the world are disagreeing with policymakers and they are predicting that rates in the future will be lower and that has historically been proven to be accurate and the and reason that's the reason that's a signal of recession try and set some context is if bond markets are right and interest rates in the future are lower, the reason they would be lower is because of anemic or worse economic growth. There's no reason to have lower interest rates if economic growth is healthy, robust, and everyone's jumping for joy. You have lower interest rates if everyone's uh, suffering. 
And that's what they're sort of signaling is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes, sir. Well, yes. well that's, that's, that's a nice optimistic thought. But you, how, how, how severe do you think this recession could be then? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the bad news is that there is that monetary component to it. So it's not just a business cycle downturn, which is bad, but not the worst. The monetary, the banking crisis that we saw in the United States, that we saw in Europe with Credit Suisse, suggest there and then before that before that there were monetary disorders that central banks had to react to in September of last year in Britain remember the budget proposed by a former prime minister who could forget the incompetence there there was a crisis there in the bond market at the yeah. same time there was a crisis in Japan with with their currency and their bond market and then the Swiss national bank which is their central bank, needed to start borrowing dollars from the United States. Yeah. That all happened in the autumn of 2022. A few months later, we have banking crisis in the United States and Switzerland again. There's, there's concern in the banking system. And if that one is unsettled, then it can make any sort of business cycle downturn worse. Mm. Business cycle downturns, banking, <laughs> politicians. Simon, you're a very polite British subject citizen you provide us provide the world lessons on etiquette but nevertheless i sense that there is something that is bothering <laughs> you despite your calm measured british demeanor i can tell that you're upset about something that has to do with banks yeah recessions, well, politicians so, so emil might have been slightly brief before the show on this one but like our, our show is titled Money Sense. And what we try to do is try to make sense of money matters, try and make sense of financial, economic matters. And there's something that was in the papers and in, in, the, came, in the local papers over the past week or so, which just smacks of downright stupidity and economic illiteracy. And I think it's necessary to call that out when we see it, because you don't want to let politicians get away with making pronouncements which are downright dangerous. But you have to say it in British terms, so not stupid. You have to say it was... Uh, Slightly illogical. Yes, or concerning. Well, yeah, concerning. For those who have never watched a TV show called Yes Minister, <laughs> uh, the word concerning would imply that everyone's about to jump off a lemming-like off, off a cliff in panic mode. Um, but so the, the, problem, the problem that we had is there, I wrote an article for The Compass about a month or so ago um, talking about why banks fail. And one of the reasons that I basically noted in this article was that banks fail because of dumbness in bank management. Bank managers sometimes do really dumb things, greedy things or dumb things, which cause their banks to fail. So Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, um, decided for reasons that are only known to itself that it would have a mismatch between its assets and its liabilities. So all of its liabilities would see their costs go up when interest rates rose, but its assets wouldn't. So suddenly interest rates went up and it found itself unable to pay off um, the people it needed to pay off. They quite reasonably said, well, we don't really like this scenario where you don't have enough money to pay us. And so the bank collapsed. So that was dumb management on behalf of a bank. We then saw just uh, earlier this week, or perhaps it was last week, we saw um, a couple of politicians here locally suggest that it would be, one suggested it would be nice if banks wouldn't raise interest rates. Another suggested, let's put a policy together to stop banks raising interest rates. Well, if, you, if it was dumb for bank managers to have a mismatch between their assets and their liabilities, because that causes a bank to fail, it must be equally dumb for politicians to want to cause a bank to fail. Because that's simply what would happen if you stop banks raising interest rates. Look, we all hate banks. Banks are evil, all the rest of it. But if you stop banks doing things which they need to do to survive because they are part of an international financial system, and banks fail, you're going to cause a much worse situation than there is currently. So if the, if, the, if the political imperative was there are people out there genuinely suffering because of higher interest rates, and absolutely do not dispute that, you know, the cost of borrowing money for mortgages is astronomically high, but it's not banks' faults. Banks are simply responding to the pressures they themselves are facing. If that's the policy, and you say the solution to that policy is to cap interest rates, then all you're doing is providing a massive subsidy to rich people. You're providing no subsidy whatsoever to poor people because they have mm. small borrowings. The people with the most borrowings are people with $2 million mortgages, not people with a $10,000 mortgage. The, the incremental benefit you get is you're simply subsidizing rich people. 
But if the concern is that banks are raising interest rates and harming people, then provide subsidies to those people who are most directly harmed. Don't try to solve a problem by destroying a banking system and causing a bank run in the Cayman Islands. So, yes, I was going to pursue that angle. That's very well stated. I was going to pursue that angle. But if it's subsidized, then the economy will start booming. There will be more construction. Isn't that what we well, want? So, so subsidized, well, booming well, if construction. Well, if you were to cut interest rates, so if you were to force interest rates to be cut yeah. by, a, by a, an interest rate cap, you'd actually have no credit lending. You'd have no borrowing at all because banks would be on. Why would, oh, a, yes, bank, yes, yes. Why would a bank say, I, it, pay, it cost me you, 8% you to borrow to money and then, it, and then, and then I, I can only lend out at 7%. So every lending I do, I lose money. The bank will go bankrupt in a heartbeat. So you will simply collapse an economy by forcing that then you take you as the government and well not the politician but you as the government then take on that risk onto your balance sheet and you subsidize the economy exactly. via the cre via the credit creation of the banks exactly. you, you you give the banks a uh, credit guarantee yes well that's a, a, so that's a perfect example you say for anybody who is meeting certain criteria we will underwrite this or underwrite five percent or ten percent so that banks 90. are you go up whatever number, yes so that banks are therefore repaid from the loans that people are struggling with people are subsidized from those loans but you have to identify those people who are generally suffering a simple instrument a, a simple policy which targets a price mechanism will always have consequences that are a unexpected and b unpleasant the unexpected one is it will simply subsidize the wealthy and the unpleasant one is it will bring down the banking system so yes absolutely do targeted support for people if it's through mortgage interest support, if it's through underwriting support, or if you genuinely believe, and I don't think there's any evidence of this, but maybe there is, maybe maybe someone can find this. If you genuinely believe that banks are creating supernormal profits because of the um, excessive rise in interest rates, if that is genuinely true, then just do what the UK has done twice, a windfall tax on banks, tax the profits, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and use that tax to subsidize the people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. For the love of anything, don't destroy a banking system trying to solve a problem of people suffering. Absolutely agree that people are suffering. There's absolutely no doubt of that. But it would be a heck of a lot worse if there are no banks left in Cayman. It seems as if we are going to have government more involved in the economy, as you've just described, and the consequences will show up, but probably they won't show up until later. But yeah. in the beginning, there may be a big benefit to the economy through subsidization, mm -hmm. and then we'll pay for it later. Absolutely, yeah. The, 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 if you like, the law, the, f the first thing you learn in economic school is the law of unintended consequences. You can have great first intentions, but there's always a price to pay, and you don't necessarily know what it will be until further down the road, and you find yourself in uncontrollable budget positions or, or whatever else it might be. But you may have already retired from political office by the time that you are time not, comes I, by. Emil, I sincerely hope you are not suggesting that politicians do things for the short-term benefit of their re-election. That would, that would offend me on, a, on, on such a personal level. It's a, it's a new idea I've come up with, yes. Well, goodness <laughs> gracious, this, this, this is... This is something I need to go and stew on. Welcome to Earth, Simon. <laughs> Welcome to planet Earth and humanity. Well, we've run out of time again. I, I think I think we almost have. Yes. Are there any Are there any final words you want to Are you want to leave us on an optimistic note? I, I I've become angry. I'm angry about the, uh, the the stupidity of some of the political postulations. Are you, have you got any positive note to end on? Well, in. I'm afraid of being accused of being egotistical, but the only news that I have that's positive that I can leave the audience with is that I will be back in two weeks' time <laughs> to talk with the audience and probably two weeks' time after that. I, I can't think of a better note to leave the audience with. I, I, I may even have to do a dial-in to get angry again in that case. Look, I'm Emil, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure having you join us. The conversation's been fabulous, and uh, I think if you and I were to skulk out of here carefully so that no politicians can uh, come mm. around and beat us up, that's probably a good thing. Um, but look, thank you very much for talking about the global economy. Thank you very much for humoring me as I put to write uh, an issue that's been bugging me. And if you could work on your flux capacitors and TARDIS so we can get a little bit more time next time, that would be much appreciated. With that, thank you, Emil. Thank you, Simon. Final word, quick reminder, this show will be available on YouTube and also on the CFA Society Cayman Islands website. Simply type Money Sense Cayman onto YouTube and you will find us. With that, please do tune in again to Money Sense in two weeks' time where you will have the pleasure of Emil Kalinowski.
Money Sense is brought to you by the Chamber Pension Plan. For further information, visit ChamberPensions.com. Chamber of Y Pension Plan. We're here for you. The Chamber Pension Plan is asking for all members to ensure their member details and contact information is correct and up to date. To review and update member details, simply visit ChamberPension.ky. Log into your account and provide the necessary information for your personal profile and for your beneficiaries. For assistance in updating member details, call us at 745-7630 or email admin at pensions.ky. The Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce Pension Plan. We're here for you.